Well, Fear and Trembling is a incredibly complicated, difficult book, and yet it's a really easy book. And so there's been a lot of interpretations historically about why Kierkegaard wrote this book, what this book's about, and some of them are, it's kind of a love letter in various ways to his uh, long lost girlfriend. Um, some of the ways are it's, he's really responding to his father. Some of the ways he's uh, kind of fighting with Hegel. Some of the, you know, there's all kinds of interpretations um, that are offered. And there's some truth in all of these. Um, but I think at base, the book is worrying about essentially one question. And that question is, what does it mean to um, encounter God and still live in the world? And so he rotates around that question throughout his entire authorship in a variety of ways. And Fear and Trembling is kind of his first real stab at um, what that looks like. And so Abraham is the character he uh, uses and uh, in order to kind of um, suggest what faith looks like um, and the difficulties then you have of encountering God and getting the world back. And it looks absurd to some folks. Um, and it is kind of absurd, and he's ready to embrace that. Uh, but not for the point of, or the purpose of being absurd, but to articulate that life after encountering God is very different um, than life before. And he wants to kind of make that point to his contemporaries. So all I want to argue is that that's the simple question that uh, is at the heart of this book. And kind of once you get that question, a lot of the layers in the book just seem to make a lot more sense. For generations, um, Hegel has always been in the background uh, of Kierkegaard's studies because Kierkegaard puts him there. And now, of course, the Hegel that Kierkegaard gives you isn't necessarily the Hegel or certainly not the only Hegel. Um, and the version you get through Kierkegaard is a kind of a caricature. That said, um, Kierkegaard uses this caricature for a point and he's particularly wrestling with um, Hegel's uh, say, philosophy of right in Fear and Trembling. He names it a couple of times. And he names it in a very particular way. He's worried about the transition in Hegel's argument from kind of individual morality to kind of social ethics. And it's precisely that transition that Kierkegaard wants to subvert. But Hegel keeps coming up in the conversation because Kierkegaard wants to do this internal to Hegel's own logic. He wants to show that even on Hegel's terms, you can't make that move, uh, the easy transition. And in philosophy of right, you have Socrates appearing precisely in this point, and uh, you have um, irony appearing at this point. And those are the kinds, those are precisely the characters and, and the concepts that Kierkegaard himself will employ. And so yes, um, in Fear and Trembling, Kant is in the background, there's all kinds of other things in the background, and it can't be simplified merely to uh, Kierkegaard's engaging with Hegel, um, particularly, because there's also all kinds of Danish Hegelians that are slightly different in, in various ways from Hegel. But the basic framework that Fear and Trembling is wrestling with is precisely this transition from individual morality to social ethics. And that's why Hegel always haunts this discourse and always will and always should. Should people read Fear and Trembling today? Um, yes and no, of course. Um, it's like any book. They're, it's profoundly entertaining. Um, it's beautiful poetry in a certain sense. It's, it's a literary masterpiece. So there's all kinds of reasons why one should read it. Uh, but especially today in the political situation we have, and in particularly, um, how should I say this? Particularly in America, the, the notion of um, divinely sanctioned society, uh, divinely sanctioned um, social arrangements um, are worrisome to Kierkegaard. And so what he wants to call into question is the easy transition from embracing God in faith to embracing the society one lives in. And I think today, as always, um, recognizing that those, there isn't necessarily an easy correlation between those two. So embracing God may mean, in fact, that the way in which one lives in one society is much more complicated and difficult. Fear and Trembling is, his, I think, Kierkegaard's first stab at articulating what this looks like. And when he talks about Abraham getting Isaac back, it seems really simple. And so what we have in Fear and Trembling is a, is a reception that is internally at odds with society, but sometimes externally it looks like you're still just functioning in society um, normally. As his corpus kind of develops, 
that easy transition, what appears easy at least on the surface, becomes even more complicated. And so suffering, um, loss, um, ridicule, these concepts become more important in this transition. And so the more one is singly devoted to God, the more society comes to reject one. And so then martyrdom is, is kind of, and suffering become the ways in which Kierkegaard articulates Christian life in the world. Now he's of course wrestling with a kind of Danish Christendom, but that doesn't mean that even today there is a sense in which one's commitment um, to God and one's encounter with God um, ought not problematize, at the very least, how one engages the world. And it might even call into question kind of the ease in which we exist in the world. And so it doesn't give answers. Um, and Kierkegaard very rarely wants to give easy answers. He wants to pose the question and force one to then wrestle with God on one's own, which might entail its own difficulties, granted. Um, but I think even today, um, and especially today, um, that pause and that reflection is important. The difficulty I think Kierkegaard wants to introduce um, in his context um, with being Christian in a Christian society is that he doesn't want Christianity to look like it's comfortable, that it takes wealth and positions, um, positions of authority for granted. And I think his target here is primarily church leaders who kind of, who in his kind of perception, kind of sell their souls for earthly comfort. For Kirker, that's not New Testament Christianity. And now his version of New Testament Christianity might be problematic and it entails a kind of at least anti-Judaism that's deeply problematic. Um, but he wants to say that the Jesus in the Bible is not rich, is not comfortable, is not the one, um, Jesus isn't the one who's kind of hanging out in the imperial courts. He's not a rich professor. Um, and in fact, he, the kind of primary targets are pastors, um, church leaders, uh, and, and folks who benefit from, what's his, what's his uh, imagery? Um, make money off the uh, crucifixion of Christ. And so he's got incredible comfort to offer for those who are um, uh, suffering and, and poor and, and, and the downtrodden. He's got incredibly kind of comforting to say to those folks, but he spends a lot more time and energy kind of challenging Christians who are um, in authority and the kind of blending of church and state that he sees in his Christendom. He just can't imagine that that's actually what Jesus died for. Mm -hmm.